Okay, good morning. Okay, today, and it's a gorgeous day, uh, we're going to be talking about some of our most reliable fruit trees, the uh, apples, and then pears and quinces, which are all in the same family. They're all a member of the rose family. They're all from Asia. Um, apples kind of originated in the western Russian region, and then the quinces, Eastern Europe, almost the same area, pears, um, European pears from that area too, and then the Asian pears from China. So they're all from that area of the world. Now, what's interesting is that apples, because back in the 1960s, we just didn't grow apples. We didn't think they would do well here. And then people started trying them. Like there was one called Beverly Hills apple back in the 60s, and we tried it. It was pretty lousy apple, t good tasting, but very poor qualities, poor hang time, poor shelf life. Uh, so we didn't really look at apples much until the 1980s. And someone said, well, I'm growing Brayburns and uh, Nelly Gale, and they're turning out really good. And so we started looking at the other apples, and lo and behold, uh, uh, just about all the apples do well here, which is interesting. Because apples are from generally the very far northern climates. The apples that have done the best here, though, are the ones from Australia. And Australia is similar to Mexico as far as the climate goes. So they don't need that much cold from there either. Mexico and uh, Australia, New Zealand. But uh, they, the apples seem to be able to work on two different systems. So they respond to chill in the winter. So chill, um, winter's temperature is between 55 and 34 degrees. Uh, the, the fruiting buds on a lot of the deciduous fruit trees, including some ornamentals too, and even the growth buds in a lot of these, respond to that temperature and you get enough of it during the winter and they start, and the, with the next warm spell, they start to grow. If they don't get that chill, they stay dormant for a long time until they get the chill and then they even if they don't get the chill they eventually wake up but don't do much so they need that chill in the winter time to get vigorous growth but apples uh, seem to be able to bloom also if it's warm and there's no leaves on them so when there's no leaves on a branch and it's warm the branch says, okay, I got a relief. I got to have leaves this time of year. Uh, but to get the leaves out, the first thing out of the buds is often flower buds instead of leaf buds. So they bloom in response to having no leaves during warm weather. Now, it does seem that the apples that come from the colder climates are better if they do get a chill, but it's not essential, especially... Like in, we saw an article back in the late 80s about apples, the growing apples in the Philippines. And they said they were growing Rome beauties in the Philippines, in the mountains of the Philippines where it's between 57 degrees and 85 degrees all year round. And there's no chill there. And Rome beauties are from New York and they're supposed to need a thousand hours of chill. All they were doing is after the crop was done, they said two weeks after that, we stripped all the leaves off, and two weeks after that, they bloomed and made another crop. And they're making crops anytime they wanted to just by stripping the leaves off. Now, you can't strip the leaves off too soon. If you, if you strip the leaves off and they start growing and you strip them again, they haven't had time to make another set of flower buds. But uh, give them about three or four months, and the next set of flower buds are there waiting to go. So they started growing them in the 80s in the Philippines. Now, it is true, you know, the, the problem we have here, we can't start apples any time there because it's, they don't like to grow when it's cool. So if you start apples on your trees, say, in the fall, and then it suddenly gets 40 degrees at night, they won't develop. It's got to be in the 50s or higher for fruit to develop properly. So um, we can't get fruit here all year 
round. There are a few exceptions. Some people do get fruit year round on certain varieties. But it turns out that apples, yeah, they can, you know, they, Dave Wilson, which is our main supplier nowadays, um, grew everything in their catalog, I understand, in Irvine, planted everything at the field station in Irvine about six or seven years ago because they were so getting so many conflicting reports about apples, how well apples do in this area of the world. And they said they were totally surprised the apples that originally required 1,000 hours of chill were doing quite well. The only two apples they didn't get a good crop on, they were still cropping, making fruit, but the fruit wasn't uh, commercial quality, Honeycrisp and Liberty. Uh, we still carry Honeycrisp because they'll still produce here and people want them and they still taste fine. But the biggest apples we've ever gotten on Honeycrisp are only about that big. And it's, it's mainly because of their harvest period and their bloom time. So if they don't get their chill, they bloom in July and the fruits ripens at the end of August. So it's like they have five or six weeks to make fruit. It just doesn't get very big. It tastes fine. It tastes like Honeycrisp. Um, the coolest spring we had, 2008, when we when we've had when we were trying to grow honey crisp, they bloomed in June, a month earlier, and they got to about the size of a big apricot. That's the biggest we've ever been able to do it here. Uh, if you're inland, another 20 miles, you may be fine. Or if you're in a canyon where they get a much colder winter, um, one of our customers who lives up in Tribuco Canyon, back in uh, when was it early December, told me they had already hit 20 degrees. So it does get cold in some of the canyons around here. You know, that's not too far away. Just Tribuca Canyon is just a few miles inland from Mission Viejo, but it's, it's, it gets much, much colder there in the wintertime. So apples would like the chill, but it's not essential for them to have it. Uh, the pears, we haven't gotten good crops unless they hit their chill. So pear trees seem to need it for certain. Uh, they still make fruit. We've, my dad used to grow Bartlett pears, used to get pears about that big. And that's because most pears ripen in the summer. They don't ripen, you know, some of the apples uh, ripen late fall. So even if they start fruiting in late, early summer, they've got five months to develop still. Whereas the pears, most of the pears ripen during the summer months. And if they bloom late, there's no chance, so we haven't done well with a lot of the high chill pears. And then the quinces, as far as we've seen, the quince, uh, and if you haven't eaten a quince before, uh, it's got one of the most, it's like a real heavy perfumed pear. Incredibly perfumed, aromatic, but the texture of a fresh quince is like rubber, so it's pretty difficult to eat it unless you cook it. So baked quince is incredibly good. You know, the, our customers buy it because they remember their aunt used to make quince pie or quince preserves. Just incredibly aromatic dessert treats. So, uh, and quinces don't seem to need any cold. Plus, they bloom on new growth, which is interesting. So you don't even need any flower buds, and they start growing and they start blooming and make fruit. So. So cold, we worry about on the pears. We don't worry about it too much on the apples uh, and not on the quinces either. So if you have a pear tree, um, and if you were worried about the chill, there's a few pears that we get enough chill for. The rest of them were marginal uh, or were not enough. Now you can get more chill if you plant them on the north side of a wall, north side of an evergreen tree, north side of a house anything that'll shade them in the winter. Uh, and again, most pears ripen in the summer, the sun's straight up, they'll get enough sun to ripen them properly. So north sides, uh, and if you keep your pear small, even a, sh a six foot wall will shade it all winter if you're on the north side. So that can really help out. Now the other thing about both apples and pears, uh, I don't know about quince, but apples and pears are among the two trees, are plants known that seal their wounds really well. So like, uh, on the other hand, the relative, the peach family, the stone fruit family, are the worst at 
ceiling pruning wounds. So apple orchards, you know, you do a lot of pruning in an apple orchard, all those wounds you get, the apple orchards are the longest living orchard. Uh, they said some apple orchards are 150 years old, whereas peach orchards, you get them past 15 years, you're, you know, your production's going downhill because those trees are dying out there. Uh, now the one bad thing about apples, pears, and quinces, they're all subject to one disease that's really nasty, and that's a bacterial infection called fire blight. You may never get fire blight, but if you've got a lot of bees around, be careful. The bees are the creatures that spread fire blight. And the way it happens is um, there's, if there's a fire blight infection on a tree, now there isn't but on this one, but if you have a, a fire blight dead branch, this branch died for another reason, but if it was fire blight and it's dead on the tree, and in the, with the winter rains and um, it gets wet, and even though this branch is dead, the fire blight in it starts exuding a honey-colored resin with the bacterial spores in it. So the bees check it out, they land on it, check it out, no, it's not honey, and they fly to a flower to do their thing, and the spores from the fire blight make it to the flowers, infects the flowers when they're blooming, and then it's like gangrene goes down the stems, internal infection. On a older tree, it'll kill off the entire branch, and a young tree can kill the entire tree. So, and you'll notice that the flowers, instead of just turning uh, tan and falling off, they turn the petals turn black. Uh, apples and pears generally have white flower petals, and then the flower petals turn black. Now you can just see that and snap off the entire flower and its stem and it'll get rid of, and it won't infect the rest of the tree. If you don't catch it, it can go down to the where the stem attaches to the trunk and again if it's a small tree it can wipe out the whole tree. It stops the circulation of that branch, turns it black, it looks black, it looks like someone took a torch to it. So they call it fire blight. The wood inside is also black. So it, it, it looks like it's been torched. So that's the main disease that apples, pears, and quince get. Um, quince and pears are much more susceptible than apples. There are some apples that just won't catch it. Even if the flowers get it, it doesn't spread in the tree. They're very resistant to it. But most pears, it can ruin them. Quinces, you have to be care watch them too. Now there is a several treatments for them. The one the orchards do, we generally don't have access to. So the orchards actually use antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics are really difficult to acquire if you're not connected to somebody who can get it for you. Generally what we use for fire blight is a product called Garden Foss. I'm a little short today. Um, we'll have a lot more when they start to bloom. But Garden Foss and it used to be called Agrifoss. Um, in many states, this chemical, which is mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid, is sold as a fertilizer because both phosphorus and potassium are fertilizers that are vital to plants' health. But what they've done here is made it so that it's a real high concentration of phosphorus getting into the plant system. And phosphorus is one of the minerals that plants need to fight off diseases, so it's like it's beefing up their immune system. So the nice thing about this, even though in California it's registered as a fungicide, they've got no waiting times on it. You can spray anything you want to eat and eat it because it's a fertilizer. It's not really a fungicide or a true nasty chemical that might hurt you. But it's, it's become one of the most valuable products we have because it not only stops fire blight on pears and apples and quince, uh, it'll stop downy disease on roses, downy disease on basil, downy disease on impatiens, and, when, and onions too. When they get this downy thing that came in from, I, we think they came from Australia, but when they get this downy disease, like on a rose, all the leaves suddenly turn, you know, it's usually cool weather, wet weather, all the leaves turn yellow and fall off. 
when the weather gets dry, they grow back, but you've lost a round of blooms because of that. Uh, and patients do the same thing. All the leaves turn yellow, the plant shrivels up and dies. The basil, all the leaves turn yellow and gray, and they shrivel up and the plant dies. Uh, onions, same thing, that turn yellow. And it's cool, wet weather uh, causes it. And this, you spray this on them, and it, and it pretty much stops them. When we spray it on, now there's different ways you apply this. You can either spray it when they're blooming, and they have instructions here for spraying on foliage and flowers. And they also have instructions if you wanted to spray it this time of year when they're sleeping, you make it really strong. It's one part of this to one part water with a good wetting agent to make it stick and just spray the trunk and lower branches of your trees, and it'll absorb enough that it'll stop it. So we often do that at the nursery. If you, at the higher dosage, if you spray leaves, you'll burn them off. So be careful with that. At the lower dosage, you won't hurt anything. Oh, this is also used a lot in the avocado uh, orchards. They said it, uh, uh, now in avocado orchards, they can inject into a trunk of a dying, tr a tree dying from root rot. They said it can be almost totally dead and they inject this in there and it comes back to life. Uh, University of California was just amazed. This was invented down in South Africa where, they're, where they created to save avocado trees with an injection thing. But they're just amazed how well it works on, uh, on that disease, uh, Phytophthora root rot. And there's a lot of, they're using this a lot in California too. I don't know if they're spraying the forest, but that sudden oak death that's wiping out oak trees throughout California, camellias, this is also a good treatment for that too. So it's turn out to be a, a really good treatment for a lot of diseases. What do you mean by injection? They actually inject it right into the cambium layer. Isn't it a hypodermic yeah, they have, oh. yeah, they have things like that. <laughs> we don't care anything like that. So the garden foss, uh, certainly a good tool for us. Uh, the other things that the next thing that apples and pears get that's not fatal but just a pain in the rear are the uh, um, well, it's called coddling moth. So the pears are ripen in July, August, and the apples are ripen August, September into October. You often have little spots on them and you can see where something drilled into the fruit. So in apples it's it's usually a little spot like that. You'll see that and then you cut open you'll see a worm inside. Uh, it's a moth that flies around lays eggs on the developing fruit and then the worm develops inside. Now it's not too hard to control as long as you're out there and working on your your apples and pears because they have to the moth has to hide its eggs because there's a lot of insects walking around eating insect eggs so on apples and pears if the fruits hanging you know like what they do this is an apple tree starting to bloom each bud will make about five to nine flowers so what happens, you get a cluster of fruit forming. Up, to, you know, you can get up to nine fruit on one cluster. You're supposed to thin them down to one. You don't want two fruit on one cluster because they, when they touch each other, when the fruit's touching the next fruit, that's where the moth hides its eggs. Or if the fruit's touching a branch, that's where the moth's hiding its eggs. So if you make sure you... You go through your fruit when the fruit is smaller than, say, a golf ball, thin them out, make sure they're not touching anything. That fruit is very unlikely to get coddling moth damage. Now, there's a few apples that still, you can do all that, and they still get coddling moths. But most apples, if you thin them down, and most pears too, if you thin them down to one fruit hanging freely, then you don't get that coddling moth damage. Now, the other way to do it, that's organic is to spray the Cap Jack's dead bug brew on the fruit itself. Uh, last two weeks at a time, 
and you can, they say to make sure, I mean, generally the, the worms get in there close to harvest time, but they say to make sure once it reaches golf ball size, you can spray this every two weeks and you won't see any worms. The other thing to do uh, that they do on uh, that they used to do in organic orchards. Now this is organic, so they this is probably simpler on a large scale. But the other thing to do is um, put a Ziploc bag around each fruit. So you take a little uh, quart-sized Ziploc bag, punch one hole in the bottom to make sure any condensation gets out, and zip it closed over the fruit. And Sunset Magazine did that research. Now, the University of California used little paper bags. They said what you do is you take an X-Acto knife or a pocket knife, slice the hole in the bottom of the bag, slip that over the fruit when the fruit's about golf ball size, and roll up the other end. And, and insects and birds and nothing knows what's in the bag, so they don't touch it. Uh, in Japan, they use silk bags with little drawstrings on them. Uh, that's why in Japan an apple costs five bucks, but... Uh, but yeah, yeah. And in fact, one of our customers bought a whole bunch of those little bags with this drawstrings on them for his fig tree. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, Sunset claimed that the clear plastic Ziploc bag, the fruit looked better and tasted better developing inside the bag than they did developing outside the bag. Yeah, it's a little warmer. Although, you know, apples, most of the apples are not in the sun, but yeah, it's still warmer even though uh, are more and more humid in there and stuff like that. But they said that worked better than the paper bags did. So. Now, we do get apple aphids. Usually we don't treat them. Um, there is a different critter, though, that's difficult to control. It's called the woolly apple aphid. So if you see a patch on the bark of a pear tree, apple tree, quince tree, pyracantha bush, there are a lot of plants related. I think they even get on toyon. I think toyon's a relative. Uh, this patch of woolly, white, sticky stuff, that's woolly apple aphids. They create a white, waxy, woolly thing that covers them. Um, that that critter is hard to control <laughs> with chem, any chemicals. I mean, we saw it on some pyracantha and on the trunk of one of my apple trees. And I, I swear, I sprayed it with everything in our arsenal, legal and illegal, to spray on it, and it didn't kill them. Uh, just hosing off with water was as effective as any chemical. They eventually went away on their own. They don't do much damage, although... When you do get woolly apple aphid on a, a, a patch of bark, they do damage the bark, and sometimes they get this um, uh, kind of tumor-like growth or canker-like growth of bark over that area. It's not a danger to the tree, but it's not real pretty when that, when that happens because it's kind of response to the damage. But it's, uh, yeah, so eventually the natural predators kill them, but boy, they are hard to kill. I mean, you can physically just squash them, but killing them, uh, and, and it's hard to squish every one because they're real tiny creatures, but that is a tough critter to control chemically, but it's, it does have biological control. So The other thing we get, uh, if we have humid summers, especially uh, with cool nights, we'll get mildew on certain varieties of fruit trees. On apples, uh, it tends to be the worst on Granny Smith, which is interesting. Granny Smith seems to be the most resistant to fire blight, but susceptible to mildew. Doesn't, doesn't kill them. I mean, we just, uh, at home, we never treated it. It didn't seem to hurt the crop or anything. It just was unsightly. All the new leaves would roll up and turn white, but the apples would be fine. But to control mildew, you can either you can use one of the horticultural oils, which are used in organic farms, like uh, neem oil or this mineral oil, sprayed on there, control the mildew. Um, the nice thing about both apples and pears is they're highly immune to root rot. So 
so they can grow and you know when the growers grow them uh, they can put them in really heavy clay soil and they seem to just thrive in that so they don't need much oxygen in the root zone uh, so they tolerate really waterlogged and they like it wet I mean apples and pears both like it really wet so keep them well watered if you don't water them enough the tips of the leaves all turn brown or charcoal on the tips so the ground around an apple tree should always look wet if it looks dry the tree is not happy so keep it real moist or put a lot of mulch on top keep that soil moist Okay, um, care on these and the training is similar. So we kind of train them the same way now. So in the old days, both apples and pears were, when you plant them, you cut them real low. So this is a new tree. Now, what's interesting about both of these, totally different kind of roots. So apple roots, they call it, are very... Um, got the term they use highly fibrous um, really stay wet a long time it's just like real fine hair get it wet boy it doesn't dry out at all whereas pear roots are just like look like carrots and they're really they dry out real easily so when you're handling the bare root apples no problem you can throw them in in the sun and they'll stay wet for hours pear roots you got to keep them covered because they dry out in minutes. They just don't hold any moisture. Whereas these, uh, they seem to attract the moisture to them. Once they're in the ground, they're both fine. But pears, um, they do recommend that you plant them deep. So on pears, they actually recommend you, you plant them to the graft union. So usually, this is the rootstock, and this is the graft here and usually they graft them about three inches above soil level so on you know most plants you can just plant them here pears they recommend planting them like this because uh, at the initial stage before the roots get going they they use they lose uh, water so quickly that this helps them stay wet or just to bury more of the stem they tend to lose a lot of moisture they sit around the graft so they tell you to bury them deep. Plus, the roots sunburn real easy on pears. Uh, the two, three plants that sunburn easily on the roots, pears, persimmons, and walnuts, pecans. So you bury them deep. Whereas apples, if the roots are exposed, not a whole lot happens. So Now we tend to get most of our apple trees on a root system called M111, M111. And that's a semi dwarf rootstock. Now, there are rootstocks that keep the trees really short, M9. Um, the M series is short for EMMLA. It was developed in England. But there's rootstocks they've developed in uh, Russia and California, too, that they're using some of them now. But uh, the, Europe, the English ones are the most famous, M111. Uh, is kind of a compromise. It doesn't dwarf them that much. Now you can keep them, you know, three or four feet all their life. You can just trim them. Um, the standard rootstock is the most drought taunt rootstock. But standard rootstock, unfortunately, the trees can grow 25 feet. They grow fast, and they don't start bearing for like five years. So we don't really do that one, even though it's more drought taunt. Uh, these dwarfing rootstocks like M9, you got to keep the ground muddy around those. Plus, they never stand up on their own. They always have to be supported with a stake or a trellis. So the farms use them and have all these trellises going, but uh, they don't recommend it for homeowners. The plant just doesn't have enough trunk strength. So, um, so we use M111 as a compromise. They still can produce first or second year. Uh, they're a little more drought tolerant than the dwarfing rootstocks, not as good as the standards. Um, still, you know, don't cut back the water on your apple tree. They do not like it dry when they're awake. 
So in the old days, uh, they used to train apple trees like they did other fruit trees. They're real lot wide, low, have lots of branches like this. Um, they've gone totally the opposite, like most fruits now. It turns out that they're most productive if the foliage doesn't exceed five feet. So they're growing apples a lot closer together. You know, in the old days it was 20 foot apart between trunks. Nowadays it's like five feet, six feet between trunks because they found out that if you've got more than 30 inches of foliage, the sun doesn't get past that. 30 inches of foliage, no more sunlight. If you have a 20 foot wide tree, you've got a shell of fruit growing on the outer three feet of that. The inside is totally devoid of fruit, a waste of space. So even though ideally the ideal shape of a fruit tree is a dome, it's hard for most fruit trees to be shaped that way. So with apples and pears, they're using what is called the spindle shape. So kind of Christmas tree-like with the branching being very horizontal. and perhaps eight foot tall, five foot wide, but you can do whatever you want. But this is actually a good size for homeowners too. I mean, in all of agriculture, they're trying to make it so we don't have to climb ladders. So eight foot's about as tall as they'll grow the apple trees and pear trees and five foot wide. Now most of our apple orchards, they use wire spalliers because they're using the dwarf rootstocks, but uh, we don't do that, so you don't have to do that. You can just have them standing straight. Now, this would be kind of an ideal tree. This was the bare root we just put in a 15 gallon bucket, and the branching is almost perfect. Now, it's a little close together, so um, it's not quite perfect, but what you can do on this tree is see okay, we want the branches spaced close to a foot apart. Now this is only about six inches there, so that's a little close to this one. On this side it's not bad. You got a branch here, a branch here. This one's kind of in a different plane. So when you got one, two, three, four, I would definitely get rid of, say, this one. Because you want some space between the different levels of branches. And as they grow, they'll kind of flatten out a bit. Now, if they don't, if they're too upright, you want to pull them down with strings. You can tie it to the trunk or tie it to a uh, stake below and get them more horizontal. Uh, they catch the sun better. So if they're going straight up, if they go like this, they're essentially another trunk. You don't need two trunks on this tree, although there's no rules. If you've got a branch like this and it's already fruiting and stuff like that, just leave it. It's like having a wider trunk is all it is. But uh, ideally, you know, you want one trunk and everything else to be a production branch. Now, there's a gap here over a foot. The only way to, if this was a farm, they would just go like this and cut it right here. So they would develop another tier right in this area and then they'd train one branch to go straight up again. Now, apples, you know, they often will sprout out on their own, and you don't have to do that, but, you know, commercially they don't like to take that chance that they don't, so they just clip it and then train the branches. I, w I would probably leave this one alone. Um, you know, at your own house, you know, if you don't get 100% of your crop, potential crop, here, it's not going to kill you. Um, but that would be what a commercial orchard would do. Cut it here force it to break about four or five branches out of these buds, train one to go straight up again, and train all the rest to go sideways, and then they, they can do it again. Now in Canada, you know, you can only do one tier a year. Here, we're, our growing season so long, you can let it grow up to here, trim it again, force another tier out. You can probably train the whole tree within one year because our, our growing season's extremely long here. Now when they're young like this, they generally, most apples, now some apples like Fuji apples just don't like to make flower buds from their young. They just don't. 
But on this particular tree, any branch that hasn't been tipped, there's a flower bud at the end of it. So this tree, which is a sundowner apple, can make a cluster of fruit there, a cluster of fruit here, a cluster of fruit here, here, and here. Uh, all the other ones have been trimmed off because they were way too long. Um, there's a flower bud here, and generally it looks like a flower bud here too. So you don't want to, when the tree's young, you may not want to trim the tips off in the winter. Now, in summer, if this was a tree in summer had a branch like this, you cut it back to here by the end of summer, it'll develop a flower bud right there, and it won't grow anymore that year. So most of these plants stop growing when fall hits and will make flower buds at the tip of each branch. So if, you, if it's too tall at the end of summer, just clip it back. It'll make a flower bud right here, and you'll have your flower bud where you want it. Now, the thing about apples and pears is both of them start developing fruiting spurs as they get older. So a fruiting spur So this, the young one there, didn't have any fruiting spurs yet. This Fuji that's a year older is developing fruiting spurs, which are just short branches. So here we've got a short branch right here, short branch right here, a uh, little tiny short branch right there, and then there's one here. I don't know if you can see it from your angle. But a short branch here about, you know, anything that's developing a uh, bump on the stem can become a short branch. And that's where your best apples develop in the future. Because the ones at the ends, even though they get more energy, uh, they often sunburn so, and, or get cooked, <laughs> essentially get cooked. So the ones in the interior branches, uh, that's where your, your best fruit are going to form in general. So after, once you get a lot of fruiting spurs, clip all the tips off. You don't need those apples anymore. But when the tree's young, your only apple's going to be on the ends. And if you bag them, they won't sunburn, especially with the paper bag. Now, the, on apples and pears both, um, it does help to thin out the fruit. You get bigger fruit. And they usually taste better too. They, there was a problem with Fuji's for a while. They, they, Fuji's back in the 80s and 90s were such a hot item that the growers allowed the trees to make too many apples. And I remember in the late 90s, you'd buy a Fuji at the store, it had no flavor. It was just really bland. So the, uh, the apple society, or the whatever it is, the apple growers, international, whatever it is, they were getting alarmed. They said, we're ruining the, the brand. So the university decided to check and see how much fruit a Fuji apple can make of good quality fruit. So they can give the farmers a clue on how to do that. Uh, so they counted the leaves on the trees and counted how many fruit are on the trees and compared the flavor and said, OK, you want a good quality Fuji apple. You, only have, you can only put on one apple for every 27 leaves. So 27 leaves it takes to make a good Fuji apple. If you have more fruit than that, it's going to come out with no flavor. Now, um, apple size has a lot to do with how many apples are on the tree. And generally, it's interesting, and, and it doesn't happen among all fruits, but on apples, the bigger the fruit you buy at the store, generally the better the flavor because the grower had thinned it out better. So if you buy a big Fuji apple, it's going to taste way better than those small ones, like the, the ones you get in the, in the bags, like five pounds for a couple bucks. You know, flavor. That, they thin them. They didn't thin them out at all. So, so both apples and pears uh, thinning does help out the quality. Now, there's some apple trees. As we go over the varieties, we'll mention them. That don't seem to need a flower bud to make a flower. <laughs> and Dorset is one of those. I mean, you can cut off all the flower buds, and all the other buds still make flowers. It's just crazy what, this, what some of the apple trees will do. They'll make, this thing will bloom all along this branch. It'll just bloom. It just overloads 
by a whole long, lot. Now with apples, what they say to do, you know, all these are flower buds, is that thin them out so that each cluster is only one apple, and thin out the cluster so the clusters are farther apart. So there's, you know, out of this, out of all these clusters here, you might let one make an apple, pick off all the rest of the little clusters, and maybe this will be your next cluster here. You have to give them some room. There's too many apples in one spot. Interestingly, yes. <laughs> well, the branches grow fast when the apples are developing. They seem to develop a strong stem. Uh, one fruit on a fruit tree, on that branch anyway, is worth about two foot of growth. So if the fruit's not there, this branch will go two feet. So, right. So you, you have a choice. Now there's a way around that, but uh, you can spray, you know, because the leaves are making sugar, and that's what powers the plant, makes the fruit, and gives it the energy to grow. Well, if you spray the leaves with more sugar, um, you can actually do both, make the fruit and make it grow at the same time. We've, we've done that. <laughs> a lot of fun things you can try. <clears throat> so some of the apple trees, and we'll mention them as we go through the varieties, um, flower like crazy. Okay, so this is the shape you want, branching about a foot apart. Um, now the nice thing about apples is the... Fruiting spurs can be productive for a long time, five years or more, one spur. Um, and the branches can produce for decades. So this, this is a pretty stable structure, whereas on peaches and nectarines, boy, you've got to get rid of these branches after they produce because that branch will never produce fruit again at the same size. Whereas apples with these spurs on them, they can produce apples on the same branch, same spot over and over and over, you might have to switch out branches after a decade or so to get a new branch with more spurs on it, but it doesn't take much uh, work that way once you've got the shape set. So if apples and pears both make good espaliers for that reason. You can train the branches to go straight. Like this one it wouldn't be too bad a one to do because you can just train these two, or even train this one to go out, cut these off, and train a couple branches here to make a second tier, and even another tier, train them right against the wall somewhere, or a fence line, and do that. Now when you do espaliers, and we're supposed to get some espaliers in in a, in a week or two, our supplier delivers them on their second trip down here, um, so the branch is very horizontal. All the buds open up and want to go straight up because that's what they do. So what you do is you keep clipping them. Don't let them get more than six inches off the horizontal. Just clip them, clip them all summer long, just keep clipping. And once we get to fall, they stop growing and make a flower bud right there. I mean, you can clip them a little shorter if you want, but they said no more than six inches because you're getting close to the next tier. And then they'll make their apples along this branch. Because they want to make, you know, each one of these, when the branch is horizontal, whatever growth comes off wants to make another tree. So you have to be careful with that. <clears throat> they want to become a trunk again. Oh, I have, should mention, if you get fire blight, or if there's any fire blight showing, uh, clean your pruners. Because uh, pruners spread fire blight just as badly as the bees do. So you're supposed to use a uh, one-tenth bleach solution. Dip your pruners in there and make cuts. If you see uh, any evidence of blackened wood on your trees. There's different ways that you can train apples. So the classic way... It's just that way. Now, a lot of orchards, they said it's easier if you do it this way. Just plant them 45 degree angles and then
train the branches in one direction like that. They said that's easier. But I don't know, this is pretty simple. But you can do it either that either either pattern. We've seen some absolutely gorgeous ones that are done this way. But that takes more work to get these to produce. So Okay, I think I covered care and training. Uh, generally, we don't use any amendments in the soil when we plant them. Just dig a hole, drop them in. They, they're adaptable to all the soils here. Um, so clay doesn't bother them at all. Poor drainage generally does not either. Fertilizer-wise, in the nursery... Now, commercially, they don't recommend fertilizing trees first year at all. Now, you have to understand that most farms don't have any windbreaks. I mean, a lot of these orchards are 1,000 acres. The wind just flies through there. They can't have the trees grow very much before they develop good roots. So they, in orchards, anyway, they don't fertilize the first year. They just want them to sit there and make roots. For homeowners, we say, ah, oh, fertilize them. Uh, they'll grow up to... We've seen pears do six feet the first year, and apples do close to the same. Um, at the nursery, we use this uh, time-release chemical that lasts six months. Like one cap full will last a tree six months. In the long run, it's better to go organic. So for homeowners, you know, we don't use this one in the pots when we plant them because when you shoot the water in there, it just all flies out. So we don't uh, we don't do that in our pots. But uh, generally in your home, we'd recommend organics for the long haul. And anything that says fruit trees is fine. They don't seem to need a whole bunch of fertilizer. Main thing, again, is water. So the apple varieties, we'll go over those first. And I'll list them by the, the order of ripening, if I can remember them clearly. Now, the thing about apples, the best quality fruit on most varieties happens when the weather's warm but not hot. If it's 90 degrees or hotter for the two or three or yeah, two or three weeks, they said, before they ripen, the quality is not there. It's just too warm. Now, some apples can handle the heat uh, but a lot of them, the, the best quality is where it's, it's not that hot right before they ripen. But they do need some heat. So the first ones to ripen that, we, that we're carrying this year is Dorset, Golden, which is a daughter of Yellow Delicious. So if you know the Yellow Delicious apple at the store, um, the interesting thing about Dorset, and this is the Dorset here, so it's the first one to bloom of all the apples. It blooms in January and it ripens in June. Uh, I'll put j the bloom time January. I'll put late January. Because they'll be blooming by the end of the month. Um, the problem we have here is it ripens in June. Uh, about mid-June sometimes, even early June some other times, it's not sunny enough. So they've often come out very tart because we just don't have the heat for them at that time. It's too gloomy. Some years it's fine. My father, my uh, late father-in-law used to grow these in Hemet. Flying in Hemet. No June bloom there. But here, you know, along the coast, it's, it, it's definitely a problem. So we don't push these that highly. Um, there's another apple that's very, very similar that I might have a few specimens around but not bare root is Einschmier, which is from Israel. And same thing, it, it kind of does the same thing. It's another golden delicious offspring. Now, Dorset is from the Bahamas. 
So someone ate a golden delicious apple in the Bahamas, spit the seeds out, the apple tree grew in the Bahamas, made fruit. Uh, doesn't seem to eat any winter at all. Um, you know, if the leaves are knocked off this tree by the cold, then the next warm spell it blooms, which is now, it's blooming and waking up. And when the early apples like this, and there's about four early apples that we have that wake up really early, they can make two crops a year. Because this first crop will be off in June. Well, it'll you can make it'll often bloom again July, and then the next crop ripens October. It's still it's perfect timing for that second crop, actually better than the first crop. So it's got enough time to make that second crop, or fruit almost year round. Um, then there's the Anna apple. Anna's from Israel too. Anna and Einschmier are supposed to be pollination partners. Now. All the apples we have are partially self-fertile, so if you only have one tree, they'll make fruit. However, uh, they don't necessarily like their own pollen, so they won't have as many seeds in them. Like, uh, I've grown both of these, didn't like this one at all in my yard, so I pulled it out and just had the Anna. Well, the Anna without its pollination par partner still seems to make 90% of the apples that made before, but they're smaller and sometimes they're lopsided because you cut open the fruit and there's only one seed in there. So the fruit's kind of lopsided toward the seed. I don't know, it didn't bother me that much. They're still good apples. So if you want a better crop on Anna, you should have either Dorset or Einschmier along with it to, to pollinate it. Anna ripens uh, early July. And I do like Anna's. To me, Anna's are one of my favorite apples. They're big, this shape, red. Well, you want to eat them, you want to, okay, the, that's the problem with the early apples. All the early apples have short shelf life, short hang time. So if you leave these apples on the tree a few days, a week too long, they're mushy. Uh, but you take the apples off, put them in a Ziploc bag, throw them in the fridge, they'll hold for two months. But the Anna, to me, is as close as we can get to Honeycrisp as I'm going to find. So it's got, you know, it's sweet, got some flavor, though. Uh, nice, tender, crispy flavor. No shelf life, though, so if you want to hold them for any length of time. You know, with, if you let the apple turn totally red, by that time it's mushy. You pick them when they're about 80% red, they're perfect. They said it's hard in the Central Valley. They said they ripen so quickly that they always miss it there. It's just too warm there. But here, um, I don't know, I find a, a better window for the Anna's here. So I can leave them on the tree for at least a week at ripeness, and they'll be fine. But uh, to me, that's one of our better tasting apples. It just doesn't have the hang time. There's a new one called Ghost that's uh, mid-July, and Ghost is, uh, everyone says it's very similar to Anna, but the skin is almost white. It's kind of a manila, yeah, it's cream, it's cream colored, and they said it's similar to Anna, ripens just a little bit later than Anna, similar shape, tall apple, it's not bad. I like Anna's a little better than Ghost. Ghost to me is a little bit less flavorful, but just our first year on Ghost. Ghost was new last year, so it takes a few years. And plus, most fruit trees, you know, they have to be in the ground three years before you get your better quality fruit. So we we won't put a label on that one yet. I mean, Anna's, you have one in a pot first year, you get huge apples. Even the first year, you get really big, good apples on Anna. Anna's won awards all around the world because it's grown throughout the tropics. And Anna, so all four of these apples can get you that second crop. And a lot of customers have told me that Anna produces year-round. So. so all these are in a different category because they all bloom early, like January and February. And they don't pollinate the other, you know, it seems like all the other apples bloom May, June, way after the, the early apples do. So the next set would be uh, Gala. 
and this is about mid-August. And galas can take the heat. So all these early apples, especially Ann and Ghost, they ripen usually just as it's getting warm. So they don't have any problem with, you know, except for last, last year when it was 115 degrees. But they don't usually have a problem getting cooked on the tree because it's just gotten to the right temperature to, to get a real good tasty crop on these. Whereas Einschmer and Dorset are too early. Gala, for some reason, doesn't seem to be, be bothered by the heat. So Gala is a good apple for the middle of summer. And it is it does bloom after all these, so you can't use them as pollinators. John and Gold is uh, um, was well, late August to about mid September. And that's one of the best apples you can grow if you're on the coast, because John and Gold does get messed up by the inland heat. Um, it gets. Oh, I meant, I forgot to mention, uh, bitter pit. So one apple malady is bitter pit. And you've probably seen it before if you like apples. You bite into the apple and there's a hard brown spot in the flesh. And that's bitter pit. That's a lack of calcium in that flesh. The same thing that causes blossom end rot on tomatoes. You get that hard bottom on the tomato. Happens in apples too and it's, exact, and it's made worse when it's hot. So Johnny Gold has problems inland, no problems on the beach. So I have a customer in, in Huntington Beach, he says, oh, I bought two more Johnny Golds. That, that's the best apple I've ever grown in Huntington Beach. So if you're along the coastline, a lot of these summer apples are fine. It doesn't get hot, too hot to hurt them. Now, generally, uh, bitter pit goes away as the tree matures. It's able to get more and more calcium. The problem with Johnny Gold is it's a triploid apple. It's huge. Most apples are diploids. They've just got two sets of chromosomes like we do. But uh, some apple, weird apples like Johnny Gold have three sets and it makes everything on them bigger. The apples are bigger too. and that So they tend to get bitter pit easier because the fruit's so large. It needs more calcium in there. That's one thing. Um, Calcium is supposed to be the number five on the most important minerals that plant that plants need, and no one talks about it. The ground has calcium in it, but uh, all the orchard people keep telling me apply calcium. Uh, usually, it's in the form of gypsum. You buy gypsum and throw that around your farm. Um, they said in avocado orchards they do like 40 pounds per tree per year. It's like that seems an, an incredibly large amount of gypsum. Um, I don't know. I keep reading that, and I go, well, that seems too much. But uh, gypsum apparently doesn't hurt if you do too much. There are areas of, I guess, New Mexico that's pure gypsum as soil, calcium sulfate. And the plants still grow well on it. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, John and Gold. Then there's uh, Fuji, late September through October. So Fuji is actually a little better on the coast also. Although, you know, most years Orange County is not like Central Valley. We're just not as hot as they are. Because most people grow Fujis because they like them a lot. It's the best selling apple at the stores. Uh, and most people are very happy with their Fujis, but the people near the coastline are really happy with their Fujis. They said, they tell me they taste better than the ones at the supermarket. So I had a customer who lived in Nellie Gale. He said, best apple we've ever, ever grown. Of course, Nellie Gale, they were within, I think, two or three miles of the water. But plenty of customers inland grow it too. So Fuji... Now, there's uh, another apple called Red Fuji, which I don't have in Beirut this year. I have, this is a Red Fuji here. So, it turns out that the green versions of each apple taste better. 
I mean, they said they actually did a study back in the 90s. The, the Washington Apple Council, or whatever it's called, wanted to tell consumers how to pick the best Red Delicious Apple. Because they wanted, because Red Delicious, I guess, were losing favor at that time. So they said, oh, let's, let's make it easier for the consumer to choose what tastes better. Turns out it was the greenest one. Tasted better than the reddest one. Uh, so they said, oh, let's not tell them that. Because we, we want red, red delicious apples, not green ones. So they claim that the, green, the original Fuji, which is greener, tastes better than the red Fuji. But apparently eyes also taste food. So at the t apple taste test that they hold every year at Dave Wilson, red Fuji always wins. Even though the, the connoisseurs claim that the original green Fuji is better tasting. <laughs> so it's interesting. So, okay, so after Fuji is uh, Brayburn. Now, I'm not sure. I might have a Brayburn in container left. I don't know if I, I don't think I have any in Bear, Bear Root this year. We couldn't get it. And that's October. Now, there are three apples that I don't know the ripening period for because we I haven't grown them before. Uh... We have Arkansas Black Spur. We've got Wine Sap, and we've got Pink Pearl. I think they're all late apples. Wine Sap is September, October. Arkansas Black Spur is October. Pink Pearl. Let me look that one up. Just pink pearl is a little different. It's one of the f we only know of two apples that have red flush, and pink pearl is one of them. <laughs> Early fall, so that'd be. Uh, October. Now it's not supposed to be that the best apple for fresh eating because it's supposed to be pretty tart but some people still like them a lot. So pink pearl you cut it open it's it's rose pink inside. <laughs> it's really different. I believe that was developed by Mr. Edder. Doesn't say here. There was a gentleman up in um, Santa Rosa, California. Uh, I can't, can't remember his first name. It's Edders, and there's a town up there, Eddersburg, named after his him. But they he developed the first modern strawberries. He made red apples. He did quite a, a bit of uh, new, usual things up there. And he lived, I guess, near Luther Burbank up there, too. Anyway, Pink Pearl, October. Um, these are the main apples that can get worms that ripen this time of year. <clears throat> the early ones don't seem to get any worms. And the late apples, which I'll write, do on the next page, don't seem to get worms either. So the late apples, <clears throat> and I believe, well, I'll put wine sap there. We have this one called wine sap, which is supposed to ripen late, too. Uh, Pink Lady and uh, Sundowner. So these all do quite well here because they ripen after the extreme heat. Three of these are from Australia. I looked up to see where Granny Smith was built. Now, I'm not sure why, but on Dave Wilson's website it says Granny Smith is from New Zealand. I don't think so. I know Gala and Brayburn are New Zealand. Granny Smith uh, is near Sydney, Australia. Now, Sydney, I was thinking, 
boy, if it's from Sydney, it's got to be a mountain near there. But we looked up the exact home for the lady who developed Granny, Mr. Smith, who, who found Granny Smith apple, lived right on a uh, delta near the ocean. <laughs> and uh, the climate there is the same as Mazatlan, Mexico. So no cold at all there. Pink lady and sundowner come from the southern tip of Australia, from Perth. And the climate there is supposed to be exactly the same as Orange County. So these are well adapted apples to our area. They bloom late. You know, usually when they bloom, they bloom in May, June. But they ripen November, December. So they got plenty of time to ripen. So everybody knows what Granny Smith is, Pink Lady, and then Sundown. These two are siblings. In Australia, Pink Lady is called Crips Pink. And Sundowner is Crips Red. Sundowner is Australia's number one selling apple. Pink Lady number two, Granny Smith number three. Um, he, the reason we don't have, I don't know if it's a reason, we don't have Sundowners being grown here commercially is that they look, the, the ripe apple looks very similar to a red Fuji. So it could be because of that. Pink Lady is definitely looks different. It's very distinctive looking and tasting, so they brought Pink Lady over first. Sundowner's here now. <clears throat> this is the best apple I've ever grown. <clears throat> I think overall quality, long hang time, and great flavor. Um, it's a little sweeter than Pink Lady. Pink Lady, to me, is running close to Granny Smith. So Granny Smith, to me, is on the tart side, also extremely firm, like you can break your teeth on Granny Smith. Pink Lady is a little bit less firm than Sundowner is even a little less firm than Pink Lady, but still firmer than Honey Crisp or the other apples. But Sundowner is the best I've ever grown. I mean, the first time we, it hasn't been here that long. First crop was 2014 or 2015 was the first crop we had in the nursery. Uh, and we had the apples hanging on each tree. They all sold out in two weeks. <laughs> People tried them and go, well, this is really good. So um, the nice thing about all the late apples, they, they're ripe kind of at the end of November here. They'll hang till January in pristine condition. So they don't go bad fast. They don't get worms. I mean, I've seen like one worm in these apples over my life, so they just don't get worms that easily. Wine sap, I don't know much about, but it's also late. <clears throat> Our customers have been telling us to carry it, so they must be pretty good. Uh, wine sap, longtime favorite, late red for juice. Well, for use fresh or cooked. All these are actually good for using fresh and cooked. Um, what's interesting about apples, they said apples was, used to be way more important than any other crop grown in the United States because uh, for two reasons. Back in the 1800s, uh, they said apple cider was the only safe drink for kids. You couldn't drink the water or, you know, your water often was contaminated because they didn't know anything about bacteria back in those days in the water. So apple cider was safe. Uh, plus apples were the only fresh uh, produce you can have in the winter. So they had a whole bunch of, you know, a lot of the old apples we wouldn't grow because they're storage apples. Uh, like I've grown Mutsu, which is a storage apple. A great flavor if you let, if you let it sit for a month. <laughs> you know, you pick it off the tree, it's hard as a rock, has no flavor at all. You let it sit in your basement or in a garage for a couple months and it turns pretty good. It's like, who wants to wait? But in the old days, that's what they wanted. They wanted storage apples because that's the only food they'd have that was fresh in the winter time. So that and cider, they said everybody had apple trees, everybody. It was so important back in those days for refrigeration. So, any questions on the apples? Yes.
Yeah, there's, unfortunately, in commercial fruit, there's a lot of uh, fruit trees that we cannot get because they're for orchards only for about 10 years. Uh, now, um, Carolyn here can probably order it. <laughs> She's got an orchard. Well, if you're if you just tell them you're an orchard, they'll sell it to you. <laughs> That's another good point. So some apples are great storage apples, uh, and commercially, they, the way they store them, you know, like we mentioned, you can put them in a Ziploc bag. What that does, you take all the oxygen away from the fruit. To ripen, an apple needs oxygen. So if you, you know, like one of our employees' mothers found this out. You take a Ziploc bag, put a straw in it, put the apple in there, suck out all the air with the straw, and then close it, and the apple won't ripen for a long time. When storage, they can't do vacuum like that. What they do is they just uh, have their storage locker or whatever filled with carbon dioxide, which is the other, the byproduct of oxygen and oxidation. So it, it drives, so they can't oxidize in carbon dioxide. So they said uh, the longest storage apple is Fuji. It can store a year and a half under those conditions and still be edible. Wow. Granny Smith is about a year. Uh, whereas the apples at the store that are always mealy just don't store well, but they're all good off the tree. Like Johnny Golds, I love when they're fresh at the market, but they get mushy at the store pretty quickly. But you have to know when they're fresh and when they've no. been stored. You know when the ripening. Did. If you know the ripening dates, okay. then you you go to the store in October for Johnny Gold, and it's still pretty good. But if you wait until now, it's going to be mushy. Right. So. South America, right, right. Yeah, so Honeycrisp ripens in August, September. Well, August. Uh, well, okay, it's interesting. South America is not as far south as, uh, like, Honeycrisp was developed for Minnesota, I believe. Or was it Wisconsin? I think it's Minnesota. And the thing about it is it's getting pretty close to the Arctic Circle where the sunlight is, the days are real long. And the southern tip of Australia is not south enough to get, you know, the southern tip of Australia is like California. So their days aren't long enough. Like they said, Honeycrisp, you got, you know, you got the cool winters and you got the really long summer days to get that thing to size up. Like, right, they're stored, right. So they ripen in uh, August, generally in Minnesota. Uh, like they say, in, uh, Granny Smith in Oregon ripens a lot quicker than it does in Australia because Oregon has much longer days in the summertime than any part of Australia does. So in Australia, things take long, even though it's hotter, it takes longer to ripen because their days are shorter. Near the, well, the days are shorter in the summer the closer you get to the equator. So near the equator, the days never get much longer than, say, 12, 15, 13, 14 hours, whereas you get near Canada, the days are like 18 hours long because the the Earth is tilted so far close to the sun now, you know. We sell it. We have some trees out there, but we don't recommend it because okay. they don't size up well. The days are too short and they they bloom too late. Okay, so they they grown best in what area? Oregon, or Washington. Um, at least northern California coast will work. Now, that's not true. Uh, Dave Wilson had a video last on YouTube that said in Riverside they were growing good Honeycrisp because of the colder in the winter. T well, colder in the winter, so they bloomed earlier. So uh, you don't have to be up north, but you have to have more chill in the winter time. It blooms earlier then.
Well, they all could use, they're all partially self-fertile. All the apples are partially self-fertile, so they all would be helped. You'll get, uh, you know, I mean, commercially it makes sense. It may, it may be a 15% heavier crop because the apples are bigger and you get a few more of them. But still, you know, you get a cluster, you know, each cluster of, of uh, nine blooms, if you don't have a pollinator, you might get two or three apples forming, whereas if you had a pollinator, you get all nine flowers making apples, well, it's overkill almost. So you don't really need it. But the, the shape is better, too, if they're pollinated, is what we find. So, so it's nice to have more than one variety, and they have to be blooming at the same time. Um, in, it's interesting, in the colder climates, like Oregon, they said each apple blooms for two weeks. And then the, my Oregon apple book noted, in Southern California, each apple seems to bloom for two months. So it's not as important, to ch you know, it's just the early ones that are out of sync. But all the late apples, the ones that, you know, all the ones after that early set, overlap their bloom. Whereas in Oregon, they do not. You have to choose, they have to choose them very carefully to pollen for the pollination purposes. So... Okay, so, uh, and again, with the apples and pears, you can keep them five foot wide. You can plant a different apple tree every five feet, or you can space them. You can group them together as one if you want, and you'll get Dave Wilson's thing on that. But single trees every five foot is as good a crop as you can do. Okay, with the pears, um, there's not many pears that do well here. So the European pears, this is a Deanju pear, this is a typical European pear developed that were evolved in Western Asia or Eastern Europe. And then you have the Euro the Asian pears, like this Japanese pear, that look like this. Generally these have a smoother flesh, more buttery, and these have a coarser flesh, um, more like crushed ice. When you eat an Asian pear, it's like eating crushed ice. They have a similar flavor. The Asian pears uh, might be slightly more apple-like, but still, um, I mean, I like both. I mean, but I do like Asian pears a lot. They do charge a lot more for Asian pears. Like, like the European pears are a dime a piece. It seems like what is it, 99 cents a pound or even less. Or these are usually a dollar per fruit to two dollars per fruit so they charge a lot more for them um, both the European pears and the Asian pears need at their lowest maybe 350 hours to chill 400 hours kind of out of our range because we haven't had much chill in the last five years now again we think we're going to get cooler and cooler in the winter and we probably can grow both of these again now we carry um, a few Asian pears because the people in the canyons can grow them. There used to be an Asian pear orchard in Silverado Canyon, I think, that's what they told me. Um, they grow them now mostly in the Central Valley because it's generally a lot cooler up there in the winter, more, you know, less chance of a crop failure. Um, some of the Asian pears are all fertile, uh, but it's always still nice to have cross pollinators with your pears too. So what happened is that somebody crossed the two, and in the 19, I think it was 70s, they came out with the first cross. It was called the Orient pear. It, was, it looked right between these two, kind of this shape with this texture. wasn't very good. wasn't very good. We grew it. It needed about 400, 350, 400 hours of chill, so we actually got some fruit, but it, this wasn't very good. So what happened is they recrossed that half and half one with the European pears and got some of the pears that do well here. They call that the Southern Cross. They recrossed it with the with European. And one is called Hood. Another one's Pineapple. Now I have both of these in containers still, but we couldn't get the bare root on either one this year. Uh, the other one is kefir pear, and we have this as bare root, and these are all between 100 and 300 hours of chill. 
all three of them. So they should all, we've grown the hood for decades. That thing uh, produces really well, even without much of a winter at all. Uh, Kiefer, I've only grown a couple times, but Dave Wilson said this one, uh, the chill on it's around 200, <clears throat> so it shouldn't miss much, and they claim it's better than hood. Um, now, the only time I grew kefir was back in around 1980, so I don't remember it that well anymore. I remember beautiful fruit on there, but I wasn't into fruit that much in those days, and I thought it was kind of bland, but that might have just been me in those days. But kefir made a really gorgeous pair, whereas hood is, I don't know, it's kind of shaped that goes all over the place. This one, nice pear-shaped fruit. Pineapple I've never not grown before, so <clears throat> there's another one that's out there called Florida Home. I don't know, they for some reason they they don't use the eye in there, but it's from the city of Florida Home, Florida. <laughs> but that one seems to need about three hundred to four hundred hours of chill, so we're not getting crops on like we used to. So we kind of quit that one, even though that's a good pair, it needs more chill. Again, if we get colder, we'll pick that one up again. But all these are, are uh, mostly European, some Asian, and they don't seem to need much chill. No, they're mostly European. They look like a European pair, they eat like a European pair. There's a little bit of Asian in them, and that, for, for some reason, that hybridness seems to cancel out their need for chill or for high chill. I mean hood does look a lot like a Dayanju pear. It does look a lot like it. Now the problem with the European pears and these is that you can't let them ripen on the tree. So they always pick European pears before they're ripe. Uh, it's about two weeks before they're ripe is if they ripen on the tree, what happens to them? The outside's perfect, the inside is brown. They call that brown core. Right, but they don't ripen on the tree properly either because the outside of the fruit ripens fa uh, slower than the inside. So you have to ripen them off the tree to avoid that brown core. Occasionally I'll buy a, you know, a pair at the store and it's brown in the middle and already so too mushy. And I know they didn't uh, ripen them properly, but, or picked it too late. So if you pick these too late, if you let them ripen on the tree, the inside's too ripe, and the outside's fine. Well, what I find on the on the hood, which is like a down, looks like a downju, is it just goes from green to less green, and I pick it. Or you can do this: you can take the fruit, you turn it 90 degrees to one side, and it'll snap off if it's ready to be picked. No, this one kind of ripens at this point. What am I used to? I'm used to this Northern California pear. Yeah, Bartlett turns yellow when it's ripe. Donju's more of a green. Bosque. Bosque is that brown thing. Yeah. yeah. yeah those are good. Now, some references will tell you that commas or comis, or I don't know how to pronounce it, commas pears, don't need any chill. They're wrong. They said commas only needs 200 hours of chill, so I grew commas for 20 years, got two pears off my tree in 20 years. They were, it was, they were good, but that wasn't worth it. So uh, commas doesn't do well, even though some books, some of the older books say it does, and that's a true European pear. Commas is considered the best quality pear out there. I don't know, I like the Asian pears better myself. So we have these. Um, there's one other one that we're looking at now called Southern King, and we have it out there. And that's supposed to be a cross between the best Asian pair and the best European pair, or a European pair called, called Tennessee and Hosui, which is considered the best quality Asian pair. And that's Southern King. And last year, our, our Southern King actually bloomed and made fruit. Unfortunately, we sold it before we got to try the fruit. Uh, so we're thinking this one, which the fruit resembles the European pear, 
uh, may do quite well here. But that's so new, we just don't know it much. This, this cross was done in Texas. So that may turn out to be a, a good pair for us. I think Houston's where they did that one. Now on the Asian pairs, we are carrying 20th century. Now it's interesting, uh, um, some of my catalogs list both 20th century and Niji Seiki. In Jap Japan, Niji Seiki means 20th century. <laughs> they have them listed as two separate fruits, but anyway, they, they just don't know the language, I guess. 20th century and Niji Seiki is the yellow Asian pear, yellower than this, um, that has the lowest chill of the of the, Jap the Japanese pears. It's 300 hours. And in the 80s, we did quite well. With the late 80s, this thing produced a lot of fruit. Quite good in this area. Hosui, which is the top rated one, is also rated at 300 hours. It's fairly new, so I haven't grown it before. So we're thinking Hosui, which looks like this. This, this one is not labeled with what variety it is, but this may be Hosui. Chojudo looks like this too, but I think that's Hosui. Uh, also, this is 300, so those are the lowest chill Asian pears. Back in the late 80s when we had like 400 hours of chill, I grew 12 varieties of Asian pears, and they all fruited. But we haven't seen that since the late 80s, but we think we're headed back toward the, that, those temperatures where it's you know, like in the 30s every night, which we haven't seen since the 80s. But... Uh, that's what that's what the Central Valley is. Uh, if you go up to Fresno area, it's in the 30s or in the low 40s every night. Doesn't get much above 50s in the daytime. We were like that uh, for four years, five years in a row in the late 80s, and uh, I was in heaven. I had like 15 kinds of pear trees in my backyard, all fruiting. Thought, oh, you can grow anything here. And then the 90s happened, and everything got warm. Then we started selling bananas again. <laughs> so anyway. 20th century Hosui. Uh, unfortunately, I ordered Hosui from my grower. They sent me a one bundle. Two were Hosui, three were labeled Chojudo. <laughs> so we didn't get enough Hosuis to sell this year, but I have some 20th centuries. 20th century is self fertile. Uh, you do have to watch the thinning on this because it does get worms pretty easily. And then the quinces. I didn't order any bear roots this year. We do have a number of pineapple quince, which is the best-selling quince. It's got this, a nice, strong, pineapple-like flavor. Quince trees tend to grow, I didn't mention, pear trees tend to grow really long branches. Uh, when I grew hood in my yard, the thing wanted to be 25 foot tall. It's just, you just got to prune, 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 prune to keep them the right size and we and again train them the same way as you do apples with the tears a lot of a lot of pear orchards they just let them get huge and then the branches just fall to the side but you can you can train them like this and they they'll develop their fruiting spurs and and fruit down low too anyway quinces uh um there's a one that's got bigger fruit, but this is uh, supposed to be the top sour, the, the uh, pineapple quince. So. so what do you do with that fruit? Bake them. Catch it. Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, you have to cook it. You can't just eat it. That's true. Right? Yeah, you got to either steam them for a long time or bake them or... Tastes like an apple, but a much stronger flavor than most apples, yeah. It's good. Because I'm going again northern California where they have the, the hedge. Mm -hmm. And they have all these kinds of fruit trees. And they're growing all these kinds of fruit trees. Well, there's two different quinces. Am I thinking of the one with the... There's the flowering the one. Flowering? Yeah, that's the flowering quince. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a different uh, genus, although they're related. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, they make smaller fruit. Yeah, yeah this, is, this makes... Okay. All right, thanks. I guess we're done.